well, my name is Paolo Savini. I am um, a companion engineering intern, as you can see at Ember Cosma. And I'm here to talk to you about, uh, a little about security and uh, how the compiler can help the programmer to strengthen their code against uh, some, some kinds of threats. Um, actually, how many of you were in this dev room last year? Hmm, well, quite a few. Yeah, yeah. And some of you may recall, actually, that uh, there was a similar talk last year uh, from Jeremy Bennett. Uh, please raise your hand, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He made me raise my hand last year, so now my turn, right? <laughs> Let's see. Okay. And uh, he talked about the secure project, that it is an open source project that aims at uh, um, adding to LVM some uh, tools to uh, improve security of the code. Anyway, I'll talk about it later. Uh, this talk is a kind of follow-up of that talk because uh, it's about my contribution to that, pro uh, to that uh, project. So, um, I'll talk here about uh, what kind of threats I mean, the threats that are based on information leakage of devices. Then I'll introduce you the two projects that, um, in which I was involved to do this work. And then I'll talk to you about B-slicing because B-slicing is basically the technique on which is based uh, my tool that I'm developing. And, uh, and then I'll talk about the tool, the B-slicer, that you may guess what it does, right? And then we'll make uh, a few final considerations about what we are going to see. So, firstly, well, when we talk about information leakage, um, a lot of, a huge variety of these may come to our mind. But what I mean here is information leakage related to small electronic devices. Specifically, electronic devices designed to perform encryptions. So we were talking about small chips, uh, for instance, on smart cards or smartphones. So uh, not like uh, um, chips of general purpose computers, right? So small chips that perform few operations, so that host uh, a few processes. And why is that important? Because <coughs> on such chips, some features, interesting features like uh, the power consumption of the chip or the execution time of the program, also any other kind of emission that are quite, um, quite unavoidable, like electromagnetic leaks, could, uh, <coughs> could be related more easily than a, a general purpose, uh, than on a general purpose CPU to uh, what's going on on the chip. So if somehow these interesting features, these behaviors, uh, can be related to the sensitive data that are being processed, uh, you have what is called a side channel. Um, a side channel that can give an attacker the opportunity to, um, to get some clues about what the sensitive data are uh, without the need to find uh, a flow in the, in the algorithm itself or to use a brute force attack. So that's why it's so dangerous because this way, sorry, this way, um, some algorithms may be quite powerless against this kind of threat. I would like to give you an example uh, before moving to a real example. Uh, imagine, for instance, that uh, um, we are um, using our smart card on a, on a reader and uh, the receptionist of the hotel probably puts a, a device near that that can, uh, for instance, uh, intercept the electromagnetic emission, right? A sophisticated tool. Uh, if for any reason, there is a different electromagnetic e emission according to the fact that uh, in a certain moment, a uh, zero or a one of the, of the key is being processed, that could be, uh, give the, the, um, uh, the, the device a clue about whether at a certain position of the key there is a, a zero or a one. That's the kind of fact I'm talking about. This is quite a silly example, but uh, should give you an idea. I also put some real example from real encryption libraries. This is quite old, actually, uh, and it, is, it has been solved, don't worry. I also put um, a reference at the bottom of the, of the, of the caption, <laughs> so you can find these uh, security issues in the database of the, in the CVE d database. Um, but just to give you an example, this is an example of uh, a timing side channel, uh, because someone um, put the padding in the so-called buff on the, on the top row, and then used P to point to buff, but P was also used uh, in a condition of an if close. An if close that if satisfied, uh, if the con condition satisfied, will make the subroutine return. That means that the flow, um, 
the, the flow control here depends on how, in this case, how long is the padding. So with a proper tool and proper, of course, sophisticated tool based on statistics and so on, it's not so easy to understand that, but with a proper tool, someone could uh, uh, understand how long is the padding and we don't want that to happen, of course. Another example of timing side channel um, happens when we use sensitive data to access memory, for instance. In this example, uh, the highlighted variables are the sensitive ones. Uh, well, you can see that Y has been used, while it contains some sensitive data, has been used to access <coughs> the array R. Um, and in this case, um, an attacker that has access to, to the system or may also influence the, the cache uh, may um, understand whether um, what is the content of Y by monitoring the events of cache hit or cache miss, of course. Of course, uh, you need to have proper tools again, but uh, this is anyway a possibility and we have to manage that too. So, um, several projects have uh, risen up to solve these uh, kind of issues. These are a couple of them. Uh, the latter project that is run by the Cryptography Research Group of the University of Bristol uh, particularly aims at uh, developing some tools uh, that could help the programmer uh, test their devices or their implementation against these kind of threats, side channels, basically um, based on information leakages. Um, their aim actually is to provide these tools to any programmer rather than, um, well, because actually to test devices and systems against these kind of threats requires you to have a deep knowledge of side channels and sometimes also um, big resources that uh, not all the labs have. So that's the aim of the, of the project, to, um, to bring the expertise in uh, leakage related attacks uh, to the table of any developer. And they partnered with Ambercos in order to achieve their goal. And that's how the Secure project was born. Uh, that is as an open source project that is more focused on the compiler because it aims at uh, adding some tools to open source compilers like GCC and LLVM that uh, uh, seemingly um, help the programmer to write more secure code than these kind of threats. Uh, here are some of the um, things we are developing. This project is still active and we are working on these uh, tools, a tool that can um, automatically be slice uh, some selected region of your code, or uh, a tool that uh, erases some uh, sensitive data left on a stack uh, by uh, a subroutine, for instance, and that can be so collected by a uh, proper attacker. And then some warnings that let you know whether um, in the code you're writing there are some bad practices, some bad choices of, of the implement implementation that could lead to a side channel later. So uh, I had to ask you, how many of you heard about bit slicing? Hmm. More than what I expected, right. Well, just for the sake of a completeness, I'll explain you well, briefly what it is. Uh, starting from um, this previous use, before we had the microprocessor, bit slicing was uh, basically used to obtain, uh, um, um, let's say, a processor with a a longer word uh, by ideally, let's say, putting together to work together uh, and one bit processor to build a virtual and bit processor, let's say, like a SIM system, right? a single uh, multiple data system. But of course, in order to, um, to do that, you need also to transform uh, the software that had to run on this, uh, on this system. That means that you had to, um, to be slice sorry for that, to be slice data and uh, uh, the algorithm as well. Um, as I was going to show you now, you could do it also in software by, let's say, simulating this virtual processor on a general purpose CPU um, by, of course, be slicing the data and be slicing the algorithm. But, and then I explain why we should do that nowadays. Before that, I would like to show you an example of a simple be slicing. Let's take, for instance, that array as an input on the left. And let's imagine we want to be slice it 
um, this array on the right is not complete, of course, because it will, uh, should be um, eight times longer than the one, uh, because it, it will have one element per each bit of the original uh, array, so uh, much longer. And simply, we put uh, each um, bit of the original array in a new element of our array of slices. Uh, we call them like that from now on, uh, the slices, right. What about the algorithm? Um, here is a simple example. Let's imagine that the algorithm that we meant to run on that uh, input uh, was that uh, loop in the, at the top, just a simple XOR operation between the, the bytes of the, of the arrays. Um, we, uh, if we want to visualize the algorithm, we have to uh, substitu substitute that uh, each XOR operation of that loop with a set of eight XOR operation perform each one of one of the bits we've seen before. Right, you may now be wondering why should we do that? I mean, um, dividing data and adding instructions. Uh, besides, uh, you may have thought that uh, just some algorithms can be sliced and moreover, only some of these would benefit from this kind of representation. For instance, uh, the single input multiple data systems would benefit from this because they will gain um, a better throughput, as you can see from this example. This is an evolution of the previous example in which we are using, we are taking um, more instances at the same time of, uh, of input. And uh, we fill in uh, the remaining bits of the slices uh, with the bits of the other inputs, as you can see here, in an orthogonal way. This way, um, you may just make a simple calculation. Instead of making, um, well, eight times more the XOR operation and just uh, um, processing one array, we, anyway, make eight times more the XOR operation, but we process, um, so, well, eight input instances. So basically, in this uh, case, we balance the throughput, the loss of throughput. But we could also use slices that are longer, for instance, 32 bits, and in that case we will gain throughput because we will process 32 uh, input instances at the same time. But this is just about uh, efficiency. In cryptography instead, uh, bit slicing has been suggested as quite interesting technique <laughs> to address uh, the problem of uh, time inside channels. And why is that? Because as, you, as I told you before, um, the transformation uh, of an algorithm, actually, uh, implies that uh, the original algorithm is transformed into an equivalent version just made of uh, um, atomic Boolean operations, so operations that can be performed on just one single bit. And as you may know, the atomic Boolean operations have an exec execution time that does not depend on the input. Think, for instance, at the XOR operation or, uh, or the logic operation like AND or OR. And so if we manage to translate a whole algorithm into this equivalent atomic Boolean version, we obtain um, an equivalent version of that algorithm that has a, an overall execution time that does not depend on the input. And this is very, really crucial for a block cipher, for instance, that uh, moreover is also um, usually a single input and multiple data system. So that would gain also throughput from this technique, as I was saying here. So now, the bit slicer, uh, and you may, as I said, you may guess what the bit slicer does. Um, practically, it is an LLVM pass, as many of you may have heard in the first talk uh, what a LLVM pass is. Uh, a pass that uh, um, lets, that automatically be slices, as I said, select the areas of, the, of your source code and uh, I also meant to add the possibility to have uh, to manage yourself some bislice data because the aim of the bislicer would be to spare you the need to bislice your data and your algorithm. That is, uh, can be quite painful because you have to uh, isolate all the, the bits and put them in the proper place, and then you have to transform the algorithm equivalent, uh, um, equivalent orthogonal version. And if you do not know how to do it properly, you can also end up in mistakes. So we'd like to provide an automatic mechanism to do that for you, since it's quite mechanical. 
uh, but from time to time you may need to do it uh, um, to manage your the slices on your own and then I'll, I'll show you how it should work so that's how it should work uh, we'd like to see it work uh, uh, with the automated um, slicing uh, I mean to uh, I'm saying I mean because it's still a work in progress so uh, I mean to introduce a pragma that takes for instance as arguments the uh, data structures that they needed to be, uh, be sliced and that encloses the part of the of the code that uh, has to be sliced and so that's what would happen from the previous example that the compiler would um, create a second version of the of the code and um, by hiding it to you, I mean you don't need to to care about it, uh, uh, and, and then it does it automatically. Well, while about uh, the other behavior I was talking about, uh, so the case in which we want we need some slice data, for instance, because our implementation of the of the block cipher uh, needs us to handle these slices on our own. Uh, it work this way. We will need to um, allocate ourselves, for instance, uh, an array of slices of the proper length, but it's not so difficult, of course. And then uh, we, um, I mean, to add um, a built-in function like that uh, that could take uh, the data you want to be sliced uh, that are contained in the array, uh, the array at the top, and then the array of slices you want this data to be sliced into. Uh, of course, I also mean to um, uh, to create some built-in functions that can take more input instances and uh, put them in a complex way in a single uh, array of slices uh, be because of the reason you've seen before for the SIM systems. Right. Um, now let's make a step back because um, this slicing might sound uh, wonderful, but... Uh, the problem is that it is not because we don't have to forget uh, the side effects of slicing. As you've seen before, slicing implies an increase of the allocated space and those uh, an increase of the operations needed to be performed because you need to uh, decompose the data, you need to manage the slices also. And as I said before, um, only some algorithms can be efficiently be sliced. Uh, we are not talking about only security but also efficiency because efficiency is a um, almost as much important as security in block ciphers and so we have to consider also that aspect so as I said the SIM systems as we've seen before are uh, quite good candidates because they gain um, they may gain a lot of throughput uh, with the slicing and uh, block ciphers they may also gain the precious feature of the uh, independence from the input of the execution time and so, well, it may gain that uh, um, resistance against the si time inside channel attacks we've seen, uh, we've seen before. But, of course, never forget that any um, dependency that may occur between the several bits of the same input instance may cause a loss of efficiency because uh, they may prevent you from uh, processing uh, several slices in parallel but also could prevent sometimes also the, the B-slice transformation and, and also remember that also in block cipher that look uh, like the best candidates uh, ever there might be some implementation of the same block ciphers that would not benefit from B-slicing just because of the implementation choices and so that's why I conclude here by saying that uh, this kind of tool may be useful for this, uh, for this reason, but uh, should be used very carefully because if you are concerned about uh, efficiency and security, of course, you have first uh, uh, you need to understand whether your block cipher your implementation really fits it. Right. Thank you for your patience. And if there are any questions uh, or suggestions, I'm really open to suggestions, please ask. <laughs> yes, please. Um, in, in block ciphers, you have a, uh, you usually have a headboxes. Uh, 
about the operation is like take uh, a byte and you just go through a block and you get a byte. Uh, the set boxes are non-linear by design because you don't want to have a linear perspective. So how do you be slice this kind of uh, Sorry, could you, uh, pardon, could you repeat the question about, uh, you were saying that usually in um, Cypher, ciphers? Or, uh, I mean, AES, for instance, mm -hmm, yeah. uh, uh, an, an, uh, substitution, 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 sorry, box. Yeah. Uh, when you map uh, uh, an 8 byte to another 8 byte, mm -hmm. figure, and so how do you decide uh, this operation, the end of operation? Can you repeat this So is uh, asking me about the substitution operation that in some block ciphers uh, happen, like in the AES algorithm, for instance. So the substitution boxes that are used to um, to remove the linearity of the block cipher itself. Uh, you raise a very good point uh, because that, well, uh, that is one of the first um, features I was trying to be slice in uh, the present block cipher. I don't know if some of you heard about it. That is a kind of light version of the AES. In that case, uh, well, just to explain you how it works, uh, um, the plain test, or uh, that's around the ciphertext anyway, is being um, encrypted by sus substituting um, its bytes with uh, the values found uh, in, a, in a table, the sub substitution table. So in this case, you have that uh, you're just uh, collecting uh, data from memory. Uh, actually, I, I kind of solved that issue in the present block cipher by implementing those uh, small substitution S boxes, let's say, the substitution tables, with some logic functions that corresponded to them, uh, you know, by using methods like uh, the, of the minters and that kind of methods. The problem is that in the present block cipher, those S boxes were quite simple because they were just, uh, uh, well, there are just 16 elements, right, uh, for a uh, four bits long. But AES uses quite bigger substitution uh, tables that, uh, and also many other block ciphers use um, tables to do their, their job because it's very, very more efficient. Um, so, well, that problem is still open. Uh, as I discussed with uh, uh, Daniel Page of the um, Ladder project, it's uh, still very, very, um, very open because uh, some of those tables are, uh, all of them actually, are based on complex mathematical um, calculation and studies. So uh, it's still uh, very open. So you're using an XOR and NZOR, do you use a, a, normal, a normal form to represent the Boolean operations, or do you use a mix of uh, XOR, and and uh, OR, or whatever? So Sorry, um, you're asking me whether I use a mixed uh, form of, um, I mean, um, in that case, if I be slice part of the program and the other part is just no, table, no. Do you use any, because you have, uh, for example, the algebraic code normal form, so you use it and XOR, mm -hmm. you have other ones, and you use one of them, or do you use a mixed or anything? Oh, so you're asking wh whether I'm using just a, uh, Boolean operations like and XO, or I use other operations also. Uh, you mean to implement those uh, S boxes? That's what you mean. All right. Um, actually, I implemented it uh, quite a while ago, almost a year ago. And actually, I think I used uh, and operations also, right? Uh, because I um, I use the method of the I don't know if you know, the method of the mean terms you know I just uh, uh, since they were small S boxes I just uh, uh, seen all the outputs and then implemented them with uh, this logic function made of uh, mean terms so uh, or and and operations basically it's not so efficient that's the problem that's why also some of these tables are not translated this way but uh, at least for that small cipher it worked yes please. On your example, you showed XOR as an operation, turning an eight XOR into eight yeah. one-bit XORs. I would expect XORs typically to be timing independent, even if it operates on eight bits. Is there an example where it more clearly shows on eight bits you, you could expect uh, it to be implemented to be a timing dependent operation? Right. So, okay, you asked me whether uh, about an example in which we have uh, an operation that depends on the input. Uh, for the execution time, and that is transformed into, um, well, a, a version equivalent that is not 
dependent on, on the input. Well, uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring that kind of example here, and I didn't go so far to uh, transform that kind of things, but uh, just to uh, let you know how it works, uh, usually when you have that kind of operations that depend on the input, mm -hmm. you may choose to implement an uh, equivalent version of those with a logging function, as we were saying uh, right a moment ago, and that's how they usually do in the papers you read about it. There are several papers on this slicing, right. and they, uh, for instance, uh, for instance, implement uh, um, these equivalent versions with uh, uh, long, really long expressions of um, atomic operations of the right. of the bits. Uh, I think I put some example uh, here. That's quite interesting because I put a couple of links uh, of a couple of papers. The first one actually. Um, is about uh, um, the slice version of the AES algorithm. And that's quite interesting to see, to see how they solve uh, the, the kind of problems we were talking about uh, a while ago. But uh, as, um, if I remember well, they use a lot of uh, um, logic functions like that. So, so if you would have an algorithm where, for example, there would be a multiplication operation or a division, and mm -hmm. somehow you run on a core where that's timing independent basically re-implement that whole algorithm? Well, <laughs> it's all a matter, okay, you ask me what about, uh, what if I have um, a multiplication or, a, or, um, or an addition or a subtraction division or that kind of stuff. Um, I think it is just about a compromise. I mean, uh, whether you prefer to lose a little efficiency, just not to have to transform completely your block cipher because uh, actually your security needs are quite met anyway, um, or whether you are you are willing to do it uh, and transform it completely, uh, because there are some abstractions, some implementation of those operations that uh, are a little more efficient for this purpose. But of course, there's still the dependency. For instance, in the addition of, of the carry and uh, that stuff, uh, so that kind of dependency can actually be completely avoided. But at least it can be improved with. Uh, particular implementation of that algorithm, but uh, if you want to change completely your block cipher uh, because you think that uh, the uh, security of the block cipher wouldn't be compromised by that, uh, that could be your, your choice, I mean, yeah. Right. If that answers your questions. Yeah. <laughs> slightly, you. okay. Yeah. Um, in one of your slides, you had this function that turns regular data to slice data. Mm -hmm. You mean the, with a the multiple input or? No. Uh, just next. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this one. Right, yeah. Uh, the thing is there, so you're losing time here in, because you're changing your data representation. So even if you increase your throughput, you yeah. have like a load in the SMB world, you're losing your time. Is there any trick to implement that efficiently or it's just uh, basically so setting them? Mm -hmm. or is there anything uh, special you can share? Right, so you are suggesting that by um, using this function, so you, you mean the, by performing the transformation of the, of the data, right, you may lose time, yeah. right? Uh, well, yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, one of the warnings I like to include when uh, in the instruction of this tool is to be careful about how many times you do something like that, because every time you do it, you lose time for uh, the transformation that uh, the compiler will introduce in the, in the program, of course. And so to do, um, I suggest it would be to do it carefully. Um, and then you ask me about any trick to do the same thing uh, more quickly, right? For example, using SMD instructions, mm -hmm. if it looks possible or... So, so you probably are talking about an implementation that from the beginning is already, uh, let's say, bit slice oriented, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's possible, of course. Uh, but um, that's really possible, and I suggest it if you know what you're doing, actually. Yeah, um, because what uh, I was uh, telling about this tool is that uh, it aims at uh, sparing you this kind of uh, work or sparing you the need to, you know, be it's too much. What about the, co the qualifier on the array type that states? Um, this will be transformed in a slight version mm -hmm. with the compiler. So you write it the normal way, and any data access will be done in the slight way. So you don't need to mm -hmm. perform the transformation because 
from the beginning, it's in the sliced. Right, so you're suggesting uh, by s to simply adopt uh, a different way to access the data. Uh, right. the yeah. The compiler will do that. So for instance, uh, you're suggesting that uh, we might, uh, instead of using this function, we might uh, access the, the bits of the array, uh, called array, sorry for this example, and uh, properly, uh, directly in a proper uh, way, just to avoid the transformation, yeah. Oh, uh, yes, of course. I mean, uh, some implementations already do that. Uh, the implementations that they still don't need my tool uh, already do that on their own. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, again that, uh, that case in which uh, probably some people just prefer uh, start uh, with the slicing by using a tool that already does it for you. Of course, um, any more efficient choice is, of course, uh, preferable to that one, yeah. Is that answer your questions? So. Perfect. Right. Any other question or suggestion? Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.